So, it's again a great pleasure to uh, announce the next talk, which will be given by Renato Renner. And uh, actually, I also know Renato. Actually, I know Renato through uh, Nicola, and we had a meeting there. And you came as a master student, maybe. Yes, I think so. Yes. Um, talking about uh, computer science and physics and distributed computing and non-locality. Uh, and now Renato is a professor at uh, ETH Zurich, where he heads the quantum information theory group. Um, he works on quantum information theory, foundations, quantum physics. Um, he has an ERC consolidator grant, and I also know him through his work on entropies. And another bit of information that I learned was that Chris Schaffner, uh, I don't know where he is, he's hiding, he's there, was a master student with Renato, so all this, all yeah, that, that okay. he better leave, yes. <laughs> There's some more here that I don't know very good. And uh, Renato will talk about uh, quantum theory cannot consistently describe the use of itself. And I actually asked him to give this talk. Um, and it is also based on this Wigner and Friends idea. And he's sort of an extension of that. So maybe we should actually not call it Wigner and Friends, but Brassard and Friends, because that's what we have here today. Um, without further ado, the stage is yours. Thank you for coming. OK, thank you, Harry. I'm glad um, you invited me to this Swiss conference here. <laughs> and um, yes, it is true that I know, or I think Christian knows me much better than he would know me through a master thesis supervision. But I think this is really a story that has to be maybe told later for the drinks when I'm already departed, because I have to catch a flight later. Anyway, it's so too late, by the way, probably. <laughs> okay, then I shouldn't have said that. Okay, so I'm particularly pleased that here um, in QSoft I can I have the opportunity to talk about foundations of quantum mechanics. And actually, the purpose of this talk, or one of the purposes, is to establish a connection between programming computers, quantum computers, and foundations. And one of the claims will actually be that building quantum computers, understand them, may even be linked in a pretty clear way to research in foundations. But I will come back to that at the very end of the talk when it's hopefully a bit clearer what I mean. The main topic of this talk is actually a thought experiment that I proposed some time ago. And maybe some of you have seen it because it um, appeared in the news. And a nice illustration, which I really liked, was this one here um, about, um, Schrö um, about cats. It was called a multi-cat experiment. And um, OK, what is a multi-cat experiment? That's maybe a strange thing. And I will also actually, I realized late, later that it's very bad that there are cats um, in that. And I will also tell you why this is the case. But let's start from the beginning, which is the motivation. Well, why am I doing that? Or why am I thinking about such thought experiments with cats and so on? So the underlying question is really that um, when we look at quantum theory, then the theory has been designed based on experiments that took place on a rather microscopic regime. And with evolving experimental ability, we were also able to test the theory for larger objects. But still, we are lacking means to test the theory on large scales. And large scales, so here the cat reappears as a typical object of daily life thing, uh, of a size that we can really handle. And of course, the question is even much more um, unanswered, or much less answered, when we go to even larger scales, maybe galaxies and so on. So in lack of, of experimental techniques. We, so we still want to answer the question, is quantum mechanics or quantum theory really something universal? Is it the thing that describes the universe? Or is it in some way just restricted to the area in which it was tested? Now, as a theorist, we, I cannot do experiments at all. They would always fail. But we can think about thought experiments. That's our tool, so to speak. So what, 
And, and I think that's what theorists always did in the past. I think many theories have been developed or even problems have been realized by physicists coming up with thought experiments, like what happens if you are as fast as the speed of light, how would light look like? These are thought experiments. And so I stress that they are thought experiments in the sense that it doesn't really matter whether or not we can carry them out. We, um, what is relevant here is we want to test the consistency of the description of nature we have. And to test the consistency, we can, of course, everything, do everything that is allowed by the description we have. And if the description is consistent, then it should not lead to problems. Now, it has become quite popular to do thought experiment in this area, nevertheless. And actually, one of the examples is the so-called black hole information paradox about which uh, Stephen Hawking and others have been thinking about a lot. Here, there's a, a slight problem with this thought experiment, namely that it's not so clear whether I can reason about this thought experiment or whether I'm allowed to reason about it within quantum theory or whether I should use general relativity. And of course, one should use both because it involves gravity and quantum effects. But we, we don't even have a theory there. So there, we cannot really test the consistency of an existing theory, we can just speculate about how a theory could look like by considering this thought experiment. But the point is, this is quite speculative. That's why I kind of want to go back into a regime where most likely it's not so important to bring in gravity theory, so we, we should hopefully be able to describe it within current quantum theory. And so that's where this thought experiment takes place that I'm going to describe. Now, a main idea, and you could ask what is different here from here, because at the end these objects here are made out of atoms. And this is the basic idea of the thought experiment, that we will consider here objects that themselves act as what I call agents. And what I mean by an agent is someone who herself or himself can apply quantum theory to describe the universe. So in some way it's a recursive use. So we, we describe systems. Like, okay, that you already see it's problematic to think of a cat, like humans, for example, who, who use quantum theory. Whether a cat uses quantum theory is not completely clear. Actually, I never um, introduced cats in, in the paper we wrote, but this was an invention by the journalists who wrote about them, because probably quantum theory is always connected to cats. And so you see this. Um, this um, claim, and this is really the a main message, which should now already become a bit clear. And you see, it's kind of a, a statement about users of quantum theory. So we, we say, if we want to try to use quantum theory in order to describe objects like agents who themselves use quantum theory, then we may run into inconsistencies. So that's the claim. And you can see if you make such a claim, then this is, appears to be a very strong claim. Whether it's a strong claim or not, I leave it up to you to decide once you have seen the whole story. But it's obvious that it prompts reactions. I got, and still, I'm still getting every day several emails. So if you wrote me once and I didn't answer it, please. Um, um, yeah, I mean, you'll see. I also get, <laughs> get many conventional mails, which I also haven't been able to answer. But there was a, um, maybe a, a nice summary of this debate, and there were of course also many blogs, like there was a, on the blog of Scott Ahrens on a very long discussion that maybe some of you have followed, there was one comment which I really liked, which um, alluded to this, which was given shortly before Scott Ahrens got a bit bored of the whole discussion and just closed the whole thing. And this was a comment by Matthias Arujo. He said, one should rather say users of quantum theory cannot consistently decide what quantum theory is. <laughs> okay, so that was probably one of the conclusions of this very long debate in case um, you don't want to read all the comments. You see, this was like um, um, comment number 294, so it really was. So first of all, um, maybe much of this um, reactions that have been prompted were caused by the fact that we were talking in the experiment about agents. Okay, it's not necessarily cat, but an agent is usually associated to a living object like a human. And actually, I don't need humans to make this argument at all. So it has nothing to do with um, arguing about consciousness and so on. And I just want to make that clear. And that probably caused a lot of confusion. And once you get rid of the 
human aspect or catty aspect of this experiment, it's probably much more clear what the actual argument is. So from now on, I would like you to think instead of the cat just of a computer. And I will explain you why it should be a computer. And this is on this slide. So why do, do I, what do I need computers for? A computer has actually two roles and will have both role, roles in this sort of experiment. It, by the way, this is now something I'm, I'm only, um, okay, when I gave um, explanations of this sort of experiment, I really had also agents that looked like humans on the slides and it, it occurred to me that everything becomes much clearer if you replace that by computers and also it's, um, it's much more clear what the actual claims are. So a computer can take the role of being the subject that uses quantum theory. You can, of course, program computers to make predictions. We program them just with the rules of quantum theory. Here you see the Schrödinger equation and the computer gets maybe, in addition, data, measurement outcomes, and may compute the prediction. That's what we use computers for. On the other hand, it's also clear that the computer is itself a physical object. I think there's no doubt about that. And um, we can describe it using quantum theory again. Now, for the purpose of this talk, it will be useful to think not of the computer as something which has a keyboard and everything. I mean, of course, it has that, but we, we only need, let's say, the logical um, subspace of the computer in which the computation takes place. And um, so, of course, it's also only this computational space in which actually the calculation happens, where the computer simulates or makes predictions of quantum theory. On the other hand, it's much easier to describe what happens in this logical subspace when we use quantum theory rather than describing the whole computer. I mean, this doesn't make a fundamental difference, but it's much easier to think about it. In particular, what I will need in the SALT experiment is to say, let's isolate the computer. And of course, to isolate the full hardware of a computer is hard, whereas isolating just the logical degrees of freedom is something everyone who tries to build a quantum computer does. Why quantum, com why MSI quantum computers? Of course, if you want to build a quantum computer, it doesn't, um, you need to make sure it doesn't decohere. And in order not to decohere, it has, the logical subspace has to be perfectly isolated from the environment. So a necessary condition is actually that you perfectly isolate your computer. In addition, you need to have special... Yes? Yeah. Yes, okay. I will just come to that. That's a very good question. So when I isolate it, we still want to give input sometimes. So we will in the SALT experiment for the moment lift this isolation and give input or read outputs out. Yes, that is indeed something we are going to do. So now um, maybe the recur this re use, I mean, talking about uses of quantum theory may be phrased a bit more precisely as follows. I and mean, this is still, still as pictures, but you can imagine that this can be made more precise. So the, a computer, we can give to a computer an input. Now it's not an isolated computer. So we can give to the computer an input, which and the input consists itself of the description of a physical experiment. Of course, one would have to formalize that, but we can do that. Like um, there's a preparation device, maybe a, a unitary evolution and a measurement device. We give all this information to the computer and the computer applies, runs through the rules of quantum theory and then outputs a result on its screen, let's say, or writes it into some register. Now we can, of course, take another computer and give him as a description of the experiment, not only this thing, but the experiment is now how the blue computer reasons about this experiment. So the whole setting here is now described um, formally and given to the green computer as input. And then the green computer can, of course, reason about what the blue computer does. So that's really, in that sense, the green computer can reason about how the blue computer uses quantum theory to, to do that. And of course, the green could also use quantum theory to do that because maybe it has a quantum description of this blue computer. So in this sense, there is this agent, the green agent, uses quantum theory to describe how the blue agent uses quantum theory to describe a quantum system. That's what I, one could call a recursive use of the theory. Importantly, and that um, has, um, has also led to some confusion, the, the green computer does not reason about itself, so it's not recursive in the sense that he's self-referencing. It's just a recursive use of the theory. The green uses the theory um, to describe someone else who uses the same theory. 
Now, this is kind of like a new criterion. You can now say, okay, and when we have a physical theory, it doesn't have to be quantum mechanics, you can always ask the, the question whether this is possible. You can always say that if any theory of nature is supposed to be universal, then obviously the theory should be powerful enough to describe users of the theory, because users of the theory are also part of the world. And if the theory is supposed to describe the world, it should also describe the users of the theory. So this gives us a new criterion. This is a criterion a physical theory should satisfy. And this criterion hasn't been checked so far, as far as I know. And so the proposal really is, and I think this is really, I think, the main general message, apart from the actual thought experiment, that this is a reasonable criterion and that one should, any physical theory that should be, wants to be universal, has to satisfy that. That's the claim. Of course, if I have a physical theory that explicitly says I'm only describing atoms and nothing else, single atoms, then this is not a problem because a single atom will not itself apply the theory. But if the theory is, is supposed to describe the universe, then this is a criterion. And so this is the question. Um, which is now actually a question one can really make very precise because if a theory is well defined then I should be able to program a computer to use the theory. If I'm not able to do that then the theory is just not precise enough. So I can phrase the question as can computers be programmed with the rules now in this case of quantum theory such they never run into contradictions and by never I mean even in very strange setups Maybe there are setups that haven't been considered by the inventors of quantum theory, but of course, if we find one where it doesn't work, then this is a good indication of where to look for a better theory. So we will now consider an experiment which involves many computers, four actually. So um, Nicola said before that 60 is a finite number. Four is already a large number if you need to argue about uh, recursively. But um, we have these four computers and they reason about themselves in the sense as I described it before. And one can now ask, is this always consistent? But now we need to be more precise about what I mean by consistent. So as I said, this is now a very precise question which has nothing to do, let me stress that again because I always get half of the emails I get are about consciousness and stuff like that. So it has really nothing to do with consciousness. So it's really this question here. Can I program the computer such that there's no contradiction. And so I want to program it with rules and now let me more, be more precise what these rules are. One rule should just be essentially quantum theory. And actually for the purpose of this thought experiment um, I essentially only need, um, I mean I don't need the whole quantum theory. I mean quantum theory may involve many things like um, I'm talking about spins, about the exclusion principle. What I need is only the unitary evolution and the so-called Born rule. The Born rule is the rule that tells us what is the probability of seeing a particular outcome given a certain state. Now it's even easier for, I only need um, the Born rule in the case where the probability is one. This experiment is set up in such a way that we never have to deal with other probabilities than zero and one, if you like. So, this we can program, of course, and, and then there is another rule which is kind of a consistency rule because, of course, if a computer reasons about another computer, at some point we want to have certain consistency, I will come to that, and I will also come to the last one, but let me make all of them more, a bit more precise. So, there are these three rules. Of course, these three rules could themselves be, in particular that one, be subdivided in individual steps. So, what's this rule? This rule really tells us the computer gets a description for, of the experiment. The description includes, um, for example, the states that have been prepared. It in, involves all the evolution and it involves the description of the measurement devices. So by the way, this is not a cryptographic setting in the sense that anyone could be malicious. So I assume everyone, so all the computers get an honest description of the setup, a correct description that every, so everyone gets the same honest description of the setup. What will be distinct between them is that they may see different measurement outcomes because they see different parts of the setup. But the description, the unitary and the state that have been prepared is given to all the computers in the same way. And now they calculate certain things and this is actually when you apply a unitary the evolution to a state and then project on the projector belonging to a particular measurement outcome set. If this has norm one, then what I said, um, 
is called the Born rule, tells us then this outcome set should occur with probability one. And so I phrase that here. Um, so what the computer would do, whenever it arrives at this conclusion, it would output, oh, now I'm certain that the measurement has outcome that set, I mean, in this, for this description. So that's what the computer does. It just has this task to do that. Now comes a slightly more complicated rule. So let's, of course, a computer, as I said before, can now reason in that, that way about another computer. And he could come to the conclusion, so the green computer could come to the conclusion that he, he's certain that the blue computer came to the conclusion that he's certain that the outcome is set. And now, that's what I now call consistency. That's now the formalization of the consistency rule. Now I demand that the green computer can, is now allowed to apply a rule which says that if he's certain that the other computer is certain about something at this moment, so that's why it's this now, it's not that he was certain about that in the past. He's certain now that this is true, then he can promote this statement to his own statement, so to speak. So this is as if I, I know excellent quantum physicists like, um, I don't know, see Nicola, but let's say Schill, or, is a, of course, um, um, a quantum physicist I have full trust in. So let's suppose, I mean, this just, as I said, means they're all programmed with the same program. He uses the same quantum theory that I'm using. And now suppose I analyze him as a system and come to the conclusion that he came to the conclusion that a, a spin measurement made there gives spin up. Then I would say, oh, now I can also conclude, I'm now the green computer, that um, this spin measurement gives up. That's a consistent. If it didn't have that, then it would essentially not be useful if you even talk together. Because whenever you talk, I tell you something, you only know that I said it, but you cannot um, use it in some way. And as I said, again, this is not about trust. So this is all under the assumption we all know we use the same theory. So all computers use the same program. This is the last thing. So a computer, at, so at this point, this was just text that they output. They, they have rules and apply the rules, but at some point we should say something happens which we shouldn't want to allow. And what, we clearly, what is clearly undesirable is that if someone claims something and also the opposite. Of course, this nowadays happens quite often even by famous people, but <laughs> it would be even more undesirable if quantum theory would force us to do that. Obviously, people do that um, don't do that because of quantum theory, I guess. So we really want quantum theory not to do that. OK, so these are the rules the computers are programmed with. And now I can come back to the experiment. So again, um, this was the picture. The actual experiment looks more something like that. We have computers, and um, we do now stuff with these computers. And before describing this a bit, more detail, I should give credit to many people because this salt experiment is actually a combination of many salt experiments that have been considered already in the literature. Um, in particular, Schrödinger's cat salt experiment, that's probably one of the origins of the cat in this whole thing. Then um, an experiment called Wigner's friend salt experiment, where essentially the cat has been replaced by a friend. That's um, a short description of it. Then an extension of it. Um, of Wigner's salt experiment by Deutsch, which um, essentially consists of, at the end, measuring the whole thing in a superposition basis, if you know about these, and then Bell-type arguments, and also, in particular, um, a Bell-type argument due to Hardy, which is also known as Hardy's paradox. And the experiment, although this was an independent work, something similar has also been proposed by Jaslav Bruckner, um, who um, already in 2000, I think, in four Team um, proposed to combine Wigner's salt experiment with Bell, uh, with Bell type arguments. So all this flew or is kind of in some way present in this salt experiment. So it's quite a complicated salt experiment. But I will now not show you actually more. I mean, there will essentially be almost no other slides than this one. So I really want to spend time explaining what's going on a bit. And so let me spend some time here. So the salt, I mean, of course, um, I, I will introduce some elements here, but the salt experiment consists essentially of two computers that are isolated. And now comes 
come back to the question that was asked, except for a small moment where this computer can send, I would say, an information theoretical language one qubit to this computer. So for a moment this isolation is lifted to allow one qubit to be sent out and here one qubit to be received. You could think of a spin, one half particle, if you're a physicist, and otherwise you just think of a qubit. Um, then um, at the one, after a certain time, this whole isolation is lifted and the whole computer as a total thing is undergoes a measurement, which will be quite a complicated measurement technologically, but it's a possible measurement described by quantum theory, and the same here. Um, for that computer. And then these outer computers get these results and reason about the other computers and so on. And I mean that's the same, the, the red one does the same. Roughly time goes from left to right in, in the sense that this computer first does something, then this one has to do something, then this one and finally the red one. Okay, so now what do they do? So now I just describe what they are supposed to do. This has nothing to do with an interpretation or anything. This is just what you would do um, when you program the computers, I mean you have to program the computers to carry out this thought experiment. And so you would say, well the blue computer here is programmed to flip a coin first. And actually it should be a quantum random number coin generator to be more precise. So they generate the randomness within this box, this is all within this isolated box. Whenever the coin shows heads, the computer is, is supposed to output a spin down particle here. And conversely, whenever the output of the random number generator is, spin, is um, tails, he's supposed to output a superposition between up and down, which I call spin right. I mean, that's just a convention in some way. You could say this is a zero plus one in computer science terms. So he outputs these two things. These are, of course, not orthogonal, but um, uh, that's on purpose. Um, to be a bit more precise, I said there is a random number generator, so actually you should think of this random number generator as, as an asymmetric one. This is used for technical reasons, so it outputs tails twice as often as heads. But this could be realized by just initializing a state like this and then measuring in, in the heads tail spaces. And that's easy to do. Now, um, this computer here, the only thing he has to do is to measure the spin in the up-down basis and record the outcome and then draw conclusions, which I will explain later from this outcome. This computer has to do a very complicated measurement on this computer. And now I should say something important, um, which I probably haven't stressed so far. So when I said that the computers are programmed with quantum theory, what I mean is just the current understand, common understanding of quantum theory. And our current model of textbook quantum theory is that there is no, um, ex no additional so-called collapse mechanism like in, I mean for those who are experts, like there's this um, GRW model where you, where you add to quantum mechanics some mechanism that sometimes lead to a collapse. But this is not done here. So here we rather have the, let's say, usual way of thinking, in particular in, in quantum information, it's the usual way that as long as I, um, I look at the large enough system that, consider, that um, includes anything on which, the, um, on which um, something acts, then this system evolves unitarily. And so in particular, even if, for example, this computer makes a measurement of this outcome, what this measurement does is, of course, from the viewpoint of this computer, really a measurement. But if I look at the box from the outside, then it's not a measurement, but just a unitary evolution. I mean, that's kind of the standard view. I think in quantum information context, this is completely clear. So I don't think I have to say more about that. But, um, yeah, people less familiar with quantum information sometimes find this description a bit strange. But um, so what I'm saying is just um, there is only like the known, like the usual laws of quantum mechanics according to which things evolve unitarily or if you want according to the Schrödinger equation. So in particular, um, if we now look at, for example, this whole box as a big box, then if it gets a superposition of up and down the whole computer will now be in a superposition between having seen spin up and spin down. And what we could do is now um, to do a measurement, and the measurement will have two outcomes here, which I label OK and fail. These are just labels. It will become later clear why I label them like that. And they are 
defined. So the blue boxes are always the technical ones, which you can ignore if you're not interested in the technical details. But the, the, the measurement outcomes are defined in such a way that if this computer is in a superposition between having seen down and up with a positive sign in between, it outputs fail. And otherwise, if the sign here is negative, it outputs tail. Uh, it outputs OK. So this is just for the moment not so important. The important thing is that this is a big I mean, this would be a very complicated measurement because it measures the computer in a superposition basis. Like in a basis we heard before in the talk of Christian Schaffner, this would be like in the same way as you give input to a box in a superposition, you would here measure the things in a superposition. Which is, of course, something we can do if we have control over these computers. So that's now, again, an advantage of having computers. We, we would well know how to do these measurements in terms of a, a circuit diagram. Here is the same, this yellow computer measures that one in the superposition basis and it's kind of the same except that it's now a superposition between this computer having seen um, outcome tails and heads because that, these are the two things that the computer can see. Then finally this yellow computer communicates the outcome of this measurement to the red computer. That's the final step of the protocol. So that's the protocol. So I'm aware of the fact that you, if you see that for the first time, you may not remember all these steps. The important thing is maybe rather to now understand how we do the analysis and what type of steps we do to get a contradiction. So the idea is the following. Each computer, for example, the blue one now, now tries to make a statement about something else. And of course, we would program that. So we would program the blue computer and ask him, please try to make a prediction about what the red computer will see later. And of course, then the blue computer runs the quantum rules. And what does it do? So in order to make this prediction, he, it's, irrelevant, I mean, it's irrelevant what happens here, because um, that has no influence on this measurement outcome. So we can, for the moment, forget this yellow computer that was here. Here, that's, of course, relevant. But from the viewpoint, if I just want to know this outcome, I can treat this whole system as a big unitary system. So that was the assumption I made before that I said that um, an isolated box, of course, evolves unitarily. That is what isolation means. I mean, that's when we try to build quantum computers, we would indeed say it has to be like that. Otherwise, we will fail in building them. Now, what prediction can this blue computer make? Of course, the prediction depends on what state it's sent in. It, and it knows which state it's sent in, because if R was tails, by definition, it's sent in a superposition of 0 and 1. So it actually sent in this. And now the measurement here is designed exactly in such a way that whenever um, this state is sent in, the outcome will be fail. So this is just by design how this measurement is done. So if you remember, um, this measurement, oops, um, maybe I don't go back, but um, so the, uh, yeah, oh, no, now I'm back actually. So this was the measurement, it's the superposition basis and the superposition corresponding to a positive sign was such that the outcome would be fail. So this measurement here is really designed in such a way that whenever the spin right and was prepared here, like this one, then it will fail. So this blue computer can now say, oh, whenever I send spin right, then by design of the experiment, it has to be the case that the blue computer will output fail. And it will just show that on its screen, let's say. Um, this is what it does. The rule tells him, show this on your screen. Okay, so that's what the blue computer does. Let's now consider another computer, for example, the green one. The green one we could program as well, and of course it's the same rules, but we also have to tell him what he should calculate. And we could ask the green computer to make a prediction or to make a statement about what the blue computer does. So the, what can the green computer say? Actually, if the and this is now something you, you have to maybe briefly say. It's an easy, very easy or almost trivial calculation. If, so in the case where the green computer got out come plus one half, he can really conclude that the blue computer um, saw tails. Why is that? Because um, if it was heads, then the spin would have been prepared spin down. And if the, of course, if a spin down is measured, then the outcome is never plus one half. It's always minus one half. So spin down means minus one half. So when he sees plus one half, he knows it cannot be, have been heads, so it must have been tails. So that's a very basic use of quantum theory. So 
and we could even verify that. We could stop the experiment here and look, does the computer make a correct prediction? And indeed, whenever it's plus one half, it can make this prediction. Now comes the important step. This computer, and the green one, can now reason about what did the blue computer conclude. But we said already before that the blue computer, whenever it saw tails, concludes that the red computer, the one which is not visible here, will at the end observe fail. But so the, the green computer knows, of course, what, how the blue one is programmed, so he can reproduce this prediction. So that's just, he knows whenever he's of plus one half, the blue computer will show this. And this is again a verifiable statement. You could stop the experiment here and check whether the green what the green computer shows on its screen is actually really what the blue computer here does. And this will always be the case if quantum mechanics is correct. And now the, blue, the green computer uses the consistency rule. The consistency rule would be to say, oh, if, the, if I'm really certain that the blue computer is so certain about this, then I can also be certain that the red computer will output fail. So that is then the conclusion that the green computer can make. And now, essentially, the analysis proceeds in the same way further. And I maybe, I don't know how much time. Yeah, so then I will maybe go a bit faster, because this was just about the principle. And, um, I think you have to believe me that the rest of the analysis also works. Let me just give a short out, um, like insight into this. So the, the yellow computer is also programmed to make a, a, a statement, and this yellow computer is programmed to make a statement about the green computer. Now, to do that, one can calculate, actually, the one has to look at the joint state between this system and um, the green um, com uh, the the green computer, and it turns out that this state here, so the joint state between this and that, is orthogonal to um, OK down. And, and this means this can never occur. So whenever the outcome was OK, it cannot be that Z was minus one half. So, OK, this is now fast. So you have a calculation that shows that the yellow computer can, whenever he got this outcome OK, conclude that the green computer con um, so plus one half. And now, again, like we are no longer talking about the blue computer because the blue computer is now out of the game. It has been measured and we shouldn't talk about it any longer. It's no longer a computer because it underwent this drastic measurement here. But um, the, the yellow computer can reason about the greed, which still exists. So the green computer is there, and this is all verifiable statements. Again, you could stop the experiment here and see whether the, the yellow computer is right in what he says about the green one. And then he again uses the consistency to lift this to his own knowledge. And then there is one final step in which the yellow computer communicates what he saw to the red one. And the red one now, of course, can also adapt this conclusion in the same way and say, oh, now I'm certain that I will observe fail once I measure this thing. He hasn't yet measured this, but he is already certain he will observe fail. However, if you now look at, again, the joint state between these systems and from which you can calculate these outcomes, you will see that there is an overlap here. So this is, again, a technical box, the blue one. The summary of this box is with probability one twelfth it will happen that we have an OK here and an OK here. But we just said before, whenever OK happens, this computer and this computer communicates that to this, the red one will be certain that he will observe fail. But now with probability 112, he will actually nevertheless observe OK. And of course, when he observes it, he's also certain that it's the case. So he's now in this contradictory um, situation where he's actually certain that V W should be fail, but he's also certain because he observed it that W is okay. So we have on the screen of this red computer, and that's something that the screen would show, a contradiction, which um, by our assumption S at the end, this was the assumption that we are not allowed to, to um, behave as US presidents, then um, we get this contradiction. Okay, so in other words, what, what this experiment shows is that if we just program computers with these three rules, we will at the end of the day, at least for sufficiently involved or um, experiments, get a contradiction. Which means that these rules are not good rules. That's just what this whole thing means. Now, what does this tell us? I mean, this, because all these rules seem very reasonable, you can now go to 
And, and this was, by the way, an interpretation independent statement. You can better you believe now in, um, co um, um, let's say, Bohmian mechanics or so. This is just a statement that is made. But of course, what the interpretations now tell us is that uh, maybe it's not so bad if one of the rules fails. For example, a, someone who believes in collapse theories, which I mentioned before, would just say, oh, that's fine because you assumed that in an isolated box there is still a unitary evolution and we don't subscribe that. So your um, use of the rule Q, which assumed that isolated systems evolve unitarily, is wrong. There's also other interpretations, and, and for most of them what happens is they just violate the consistency. So it would not be, within that theory, it would not be true that um, if I'm sure that someone else is sure about something, I still cannot be sure that this is actually true, even though the other person used exactly the same theory and the same interpretation and all that. Now, for, for many worlds, it's a bit subtle because there's a choice. That's why I put here this question mark. You can now interpret many worlds in, I mean, many worlds, there are many, many worlds interpretations, and one, of course, is the one that Gilles Brassard will just tell us about, but in one of, you can have a choice, you can say either many worlds really tells you at any moment in time anything happens in some way, in which case there is, you can never be, I mean, there are all these branches and there's no connection between me now standing here and me a second later. In this case, Everything is consistent, but you don't really make a reasonable claim because you, you cannot, I mean, you just say at any time everything happens, essentially. But as soon as you now try to kind of say there are at least branches in which you stay, once I'm in a branch, like I, I saw out, this outcome and now I stay in this branch, then you also run into this, then you, you violate this consistency requirement. So then you can no longer reason about others in a consistent way. Um, okay. But, um, Given time, I, I have to proceed a bit. So let's just go back to the initial questions. So the initial question was, is quantum theory really valid here? And so what this experiment shows is that if we ask the theory to satisfy this consistency criterion, which becomes relevant once we have systems which are sufficiently large so that they can themselves apply the theory, then we have a real problem here with our current understanding of quantum theory. And so far, I haven't seen a resolution of this problem. That's why I would, why I would put up a challenge. So the challenge is really, I mean, people always say, oh, this thought experiment is maybe wrong. Maybe you made a mistake. So I now have to turn this around because no one could point to a mistake. I would just say the challenge is now whatever, and, and we will put that as an actual challenge where we put the framework to program such computers. On, of course, this will all be simulated in some way, and then you can hand in your program that describes your view of how these computers should use quantum theory. And then we'll just run it and see whether it, they arrive at the contradiction. And of course, what I showed you now is if they just use quantum theory in the way I used it now, they will get contradictions. You somehow have to modify something. And so the question is, can you find a, consist a modification of quantum theory which makes these um, computers again act consistently? I haven't seen such a thing, but what I should say, if you do this challenge, of course, what you want is, first of all, as I said, there is no contradiction here. But another criterion is that still in normal situations, like, for example, when I talk to you, I usually use this rule, we should still be able to, um, to apply the series. In other words, if someone comes with um, a modification of quantum theory, which just says, um, agents cannot talk about the other agents, then probably you don't run into inconsistency any longer, but you cannot even then use this here in daily life situations where someone tells me something and I want to kind of use that knowledge. So there's this thing that you cannot arbitrarily weaken quantum theory to make this consistent. You have to keep track of the usual thing where you want to apply to, and that's kind of the tension between the two, and I think this is really seems to be a kind of relatively hard challenge. At least no one, to my knowledge, has solved it so far. So find a consistent variant of quantum theory that really works in such setups, but still works in daily life situations. That's the, obviously an important challenge, I think. Okay, so with that I would like um, to thank, first of all, the members of the groups with whom I had um, long discussions about this. By the way, this is Daniela Frauchiger, the co-author of this work. And um, at the moment, Nuria and um, Lydia are continuing to work on 
um, problems, and they are involved in setting up the framework for this challenge so that you can really formalize these rules to be programmed, to, for the computers to be programmed. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention. Maybe a very quick question. Peter. Yes. Given the size of the group, mm -hmm. I'm curious whether someone amongst you has thought about how this connects to Gurdle incompleteness. Oh, yes. Gurdle incompleteness basically tells you that you cannot do this in the classical world. Mm -hmm. You can run a computer to prove mathematics. But you cannot run the same computer in such a way that it proves that it doesn't make errors. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a very good. Yes. Yes. So, mm -hmm. isn't what you're doing just attempt to read it off as going back to Gerber's original argument, mm -hmm. move it to the quantum world, and repeat it? Yes. Yes, okay, that's a very good point. I should have, uh, I should have um, mentioned Gödel in this context. But let me stress one point. Of course, what, what we learn from Gödel is that we will never be able to prove that a theory is consistent. However, what we are doing here is the opposite with this sort of experiment. So, I mean, not the, so the challenge is, is something different. But first of all, what, what this thing here says is just, this part, here we found an explicit inconsistency. That's, of course, not excluded by Gödel. We can, if we find an, a particular case where a theory is inconsistent, that's fine. Then we just know the theory is inconsistent. We just cannot do the opposite and prove that there is no inconsistency. So in that sense, the, this claim is, in, is really not contradicting anything Gödel would say. However, here the challenge, the purpose of the challenge is not I mean, this would be, of course, much nicer. It's not to prove at the end that we have a consistent program. What I want is something um, kind of more modest. I just want to have a set of rules such that, at least in this particular setup, the contradiction that arises when I use the usual rules of quantum theory no longer arises. But you're right that this would not imply at all that the rules are then consistent. But at least then we have again hope. So for the current rules, we know they are inconsistent. That's what this thought experiment shows. So the next step is to find rules where we can again be hopeful that they are not inconsistent. That's how I see it. I think. Final question to Richard. Uh, if uh, Slava Vilakki would still be with us, he would immediately say yes, but the problem is that you only have a finite dimensional Hilbert space. If whom was with, with us, sorry. Sorry, if Slava Velavkin, uh -huh, yes. mm -hmm. the famous mm -hmm. opponent yes. of uh, mm -hmm. uh, Plevo, yes. Yes. Uh, if he would be here, mm -hmm. uh, he would say that, that mm -hmm. he believes, or he already knew, that this problem can be solved by going from finite dimensional Hilbert space to infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Yes. Yes, actually, um, that's also a, a good point, but it has, again, to do with my choice now of using yeah. computers, because we know, of course, I mean, by construction of computers, that the relevant Hilbert space is, that's why I said at the beginning, we look at this logical subspace, this is a finite space. So now, if I find a contradiction in the finite space, yes. then I cannot resolve it by adding dimensions outside. So, uh, I think... Um, I'm not sure about that. Okay, then um, it, maybe there's a way out through that, which I'm not aware of, but let's say the claim is that here, this is an, ex this is an example which shows that there is already a contradiction if we do an experiment with infinite dimensional subspaces, and so, yes. Um, I guess we're running a little bit late, so maybe questions uh, deferred to the, to the drinks. Um, yeah. Thank you very much okay. for... Thank you. Intriguing talk.